Hi, I'm Simon. Welcome to The Ordinary Filmmaker. This is my weekly question and answer session where I answer questions you pose to me throughout the week. Today I'm shooting on the R5. I've actually had this camera, I've been using this camera for about seven days, but the camera that I have now is actually my own that I purchased on Thursday. Last weekend, I had the R5 for about three or four days and that was on loan by Canon. Both units were production cameras. And I've shot this camera with uh, in temperatures between 60 degrees. Right now it's 62 degrees. It's sunny, but I'm in the shade, so I've set the white balance to shade. But I've also shot in 85 degree temperature where it's hot and humid and I haven't had a problem with heating. I don't expect there to be a problem today because I'm shooting in 4K 30, 29 frames per second, all eye, although I do have C-Log on and we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, the one of the things I've done a little differently today, because I do have some changing light patterns here, I want to make sure I don't have any problems, uh, but this is one of the things we're going to see being an ordinary filmmaker you try things out see how they work and try to get the best results so everything is set to manual with the exception of iso i've let it wander it's in auto mode because i do have a bit of a challenge with this background and i kind of like this background so let's see how it goes might not work out but that's part of being the ordinary filmmaker you try things out if they work great if not well you learn and adapt for next time all right so it's been a very busy week uh, the reason I brought up the temperature and how long I've had the camera because there's a lot of discussion about overheating. Now I've had this camera, like I said, for seven days. It's never felt hot in my hand. In fact, I've never, re I've actually had to feel and touch around to see if I notice any overheating because it's never registered any sort of heat to my touch that I've thought to be concerning. And after I shot it last week for about a good couple of hours, the camera was not hot. But one thing I did notice that was very hot was the CF Express card. So those things are very hot to the touch, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's where we're getting a lot of our heat buildup from. That being said, uh, if I do encounter any problems during the shoot, I will let you guys know. Uh, it might be in the behind the scenes, or I might just overlay it onto the screen. And also, if the, the shifting light causes ISO to do some strange things, I will also let you know that in comments as well. But um, it's completely sunny, so I don't expect a lot of changes. I'm hoping this actually works out nicely. All right, let's go ahead and get into the questions. Stop the FOMO asks, using an Atmos Ninja with the R5, would it eliminate overheating in 4K60 recording in all modes? That's a very good question. Gerald Undone actually did a video on this and he found out that by using an Atmos Ninja, it significantly increased the record times. I think he got almost three hours. I don't know if that was in 4K60 or the other modes, but he definitely noticed a huge increase. So yes, Using an external recorder will dramatically increase the, uh, the time that you can record before overheating. And another big plus of using an Atmos Ninja or any other recorder, <sighs> deep breath. None of those artificial 29.59 second record times or 29 minutes and 59 second record times. So that's another big plus, FOMO. DGK asks, can you talk a little bit about IPB versus all eye compression? Also, what codec are under each? Well, I already did. If you go back and look at my July 12th question and answer session, I spent a good lot of time and I think there was about three questions related to IPB versus all I. I explained the difference, how they work. So I would suggest you go ahead and watch that. But I will mention one thing. Yesterday, I shot a video in IPB. I shot one, two videos, I think. The first one, uh, which was about the LUTs, that was shot in all I. But the second one, it was shot in, I, shot in IPB and nobody noticed it. I didn't mention it. So you can go ahead and look at that video and see if you noticed any problems. I suspect you won't because it's a studio shot. I'm sitting in a chair much like this. There's no motion. In fact, I could have shot this entire video using IPB because there's really very little movement behind me. Now, if the wind picks up and moves some of the, the leaves, we could have some artifacting, but by and large, it's not a big issue. Dogda asks, is excessive overheating going to be detrimental in the R5 or an R6 in the long run? Will they last as long as our faithful DSLRs? Yeah, very topical. No, I'm not really worried about it. Uh, long term, yeah, it could potentially be a problem. It could be a problem five, six, seven years out. But at this point, I have no really way of knowing. And there's not, nothing really sort of setting off my spider senses. After shooting for a good long time in this camera, it's not hot to the touch. So I'm, I'm not really seeing any alarm bells at, at all with this. Uh, I'm wondering if Canon is being a little bit too... Uh, sensitive with the tolerances. Um, I'm wondering um, if, if a lot of this can be fixed in firmware. I don't know. Maybe they could put uh, 
some sort of um, cooling plate or something inside the camera to help with it. Uh, but it's really hard to tell. There, there is some discussion about a potential recall right now, but uh, Craig at Canada Rumors has walked that back a little bit. But then last night when I was watching Peter Gregg live, he mentioned that he had some sources saying that, you know, we're not going to see any new cameras until December and that there could potentially be a hardware fix. And this has happened in the past. Uh, there was a situation where light was leaking through, so they recalled them, and it was more or less just putting a bit of tape inside it. So... Um, you know, anything's possible at this point, but I'm not worried if, if they do go ahead and um, make some sort of minor hardware design change, then I wouldn't be surprised if there would be a recall for everybody else. Since they're limiting the ones out there, it's not going to be a huge exposure. Um, but I definitely believe that Canon's going to get in front of this, uh, and they're going to make an announcement relatively soon, and let us know what's going on, because I don't... I, I can't see them uh, taking what is... In, let's be honest here it's truly amazing camera and its capabilities it's it's an awesome photo camera with really really good video capabilities so i i don't see them because well, how long do they it was four years since they so four years ago they put out the uh, 5d mark IV. um they probably won't do a mark ii of this camera for probably another three years or so so they're they're, they're going to get in front of this they're not going to um, they're not going to let their reputation get tarnished because if they do, if this, if they don't solve this or address it somehow, then Sony's just going to step up. They're going to announce the a7 IV and they're going to take the number one spot from Canon because right now Canon is the number one maker of Canon cameras or number one maker of cameras in the world. So will they last as long as the DSLRs? Um, too early to tell at this point. Rocks the Man asks, isn't the a7 III more of a camera for the ordinary filmmaker? Smaller files, smaller camera, cheaper lenses, less heat management, dual recording, no need for new cards to have two card slots, no record limits, no adapter needed, seems easier to get into video. Um, that's a very good point. Um, is it a better camera? Uh, it's, it's a terrific camera. It's a solid camera. I'd say that the a7S III is more of a video-centric camera, so if you're the type of person that's getting the R5 or looking for a, a really solid photo camera, then I would say that the R5 would be a better camera than the a7S III. You, you said something very key there, in there, and you talked about what would be better for the ordinary filmmaker, and I've even admitted myself that the R5 is the most expensive camera that the ordinary filmmaker could potentially afford, so this is right at the upper limit. It's a lot of money. Um, if you're starting a business, though, it's not a lot of money. To be able to start a business for under $10,000, um, is, is, you're, you're very fortunate. Um, so I... I for the ordinary filmmaker, I think there are other cameras that would be better suited to starting out, maybe like the X-T4. It's definitely a lot cheaper. Uh, the EOS R, for example, um, or even going down an APC, something like a Canon 90D, uh, maybe the Sony A6100, or even the, the newly released, or I believe it's out, uh, they delayed it. It's the Rebel T8i. Uh, these cameras are all sub $1,000 and produce really great results, really great 4K and I would think they would be better cameras. Now, if you're talking about a full frame, then that changes things a little bit. You've got the Nikon Z6. Uh, the Sony a7S III, though, is a terrific camera. It's something I'm going to be getting myself, uh, but it is video-centric. Uh, the R5 is a, is a great balance. It's photo-centric with a ton of really, really good video features. And as I mentioned at the beginning, overheating I don't really see as being a big issue because while I'm shooting in 4K30 now, and I've done a lot of 4K30 shooting, in segments of over an hour and I've yet to have an issue with it. Uh, in terms of dual card slots, well actually I've actually put uh, UHS-1 cards into this camera and it works perfectly fine with them. The only issue you're going to have there is obviously a V30. You're, you're limited in what it can actually do in the camera and some of those higher frame rates but you can put them in there. Um, dual cards, I don't know if the Sony a7S III does this but most dual card cameras only record to both card slots for photos rarely does it do for video but yeah i'm not i'm not trying to in any way say that the a7s3 isn't a great camera it is a terrific solid camera i'm eager to get my hands on it but for the ordinary filmmaker if you're starting out then you know maybe consider some aps-c cameras or some of the lower priced uh, full frame entry cameras like the canon rp or the nikon uh, z5 although i'd wait for the nikon z5 to come down a little bit in price i think at at the price that it's been announced it's it's a little bit steep Dotka asks, how is the rolling shutter on the R5? I'd love to see you test that out. Well, Dotka, I did test that out yesterday. I was getting ready for this 
uh, Q&A session. I was looking through all the questions and I quickly shot some video. Um, and what's really interesting about this is last weekend when I had the camera, I was shooting in 8K and I just kind of quickly panned and it was really strange. I didn't notice any rolling shutter and I thought to myself, that's strange, that, that's 8K. It should have severe rolling shutter. I didn't say anything of it because I wasn't really testing it. I was focused on something else. And because I only shot for just a brief moment, I didn't want to bring it up. But yesterday in 4K30 HQ, I was out here in my backyard and I shot, I panned slowly and I panned rather quickly, as you can see right here. And yes, you can see some rolling shutter, but it's, it's quite minor. It's to the point where unless you're you and I, Unless you're a professional or unless you're somebody who does a lot of video, you're probably not going to notice it. The average person isn't going to notice it. And if you watch a lot of Hollywood movies, and when they pan quickly, you'll even notice some rolling shutter in there. I didn't either until I started filming, until I started watching out for these things. But you'll even see it in some Hollywood uh, movies. So what you got to ask yourself here, is the rolling shutter minor enough that you don't really consider it a concern? For me, no, I, I'm, I'm quite impressed with it. I think... The R5 does a really good job of rolling shutter. But let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Yup, B Singh asks, may I know what B-roll is? That's a really good question. Uh, it's very simple to answer. And now B-roll or B-reel as it's known uh, versus A-roll. And what I'm shooting right now for this video is all A-roll. So once I bring it into the computer, this gets laid down first. And if I was to export, all you would see is just me talking for a good solid hour or less. In the previous question, I answered a question regarding rolling shutter, and as I was talking, all of a sudden, then you got to see some samples of rolling shutter and how that performed. That video is called B-roll or B-reel, and what happens in the video editing software, that's overlaid over top of the A-roll, and then when the playhead goes over, instead of playing, it, it's playing me, 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 until it hits the rolling shutter footage, and then all of a sudden, the rolling shutter footage is played. And you can stack it more than just a b-roll but b-roll is referred to as that supplementary footage uh, another good example reporters on the news quite often they'll be there they'll be talking on a mic and all of a sudden it'll cut to some scenes of whatever it is they're talking about that stuff that they cut to that's also considered b-roll or b-reel so good question jonathan guy says i've seen several reviews on cf express card readers that mention how hot they become when pulling images and videos into the computer could the cards themselves be a major source of heat with the R5? Yes, definitely. Um, they're focusing on pulling it into the computer. And in the case of my computer, it's so fast that I can get that stuff off pretty quickly. My computer's bus speed or the, the, the storage speed, uh, the SSDs are 3000 megabytes a second. So I'm able to just pull stuff off so quickly. However, when I'm shooting videos like this, where the CF Express card is the only one that I use, it's in use for a good solid hour. And here's the problem with that. It gets very hot to the point where when I pull it out at the end of the shoot, it's hot to the touch. Not hot enough that I'll drop it, but enough that it really gets your attention. And that heat, that really adds up. So not only is the card generating heat inside, but even when it's not in use, it's generating heat. So if it's not completely efficient with how it deals with that, that could definitely have an impact as well. So that's a really, really good observation, but I'd say it's more of a concern definitely inside the, the camera. Uh, and even when it's not recording, it's still generating heat. So very, very good point. Now the UHS-2 cards, they don't seem to get as hot and they don't have as much surface area. So that probably means they're not generating as much heat. I'd be curious to do a test between CF Express and uh, the UHS-2 SD cards and see if it changes the record times. Uh, I, I imagine that 4K60 with IPB might be able to write to the UHS-2 card. You just have to wait and see. Uh, top speed of 300 megabytes a second by 8, 3, 8, 24, that's 2,400 megabits per second. It's possible. But unfortunately, I don't have a UHS-2 card right now, but really, really good question. Okay, sort of a follow-up to Jonathan's last question. Have you seen any complaints about the lack of 24P in the R5? Could 24 versus 30p help in the overheating issue? Well, Jonathan, I only shot 24p once. Other than that, I always shoot in 30p. Whenever I shoot in 24, people say it's a little bit jerky, and well, that's the nature of 24p. I like 20, I like 30p because it's smoother. It reproduces life as it happens. Um, less of a dreamy look, more of a documentary look, and that's fine with me. But in terms of 24p, it's there in every mode, as far as I can tell. 
Um, selecting the video modes is very simple. At first, you, you pick with it what resolution you want, then you get to pick the um, uh, compression type and then your frame rate. So I really haven't seen any issues there at all. But in terms of could it make a difference? Well, so you got 24 fra frames versus 30 frames. That's an additional six frames or 20%. So you're, you're, you've got a higher data rate. So yeah, I could see that increasing the heat, but to what degree, I don't know. Um, if you're a content creator and you want to use 30p versus 24p, don't worry about the heat. Um, if that's really getting in the way, then obviously this is the wrong camera for you. Uh, you, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't measured it. I don't have the right tools to even properly measure it, even if I have the right SD cards to do it. But very, very you're digging deep. Are you an, inve an investigative journalist, Jonathan? Really good question. Oh, speaking of investigative journalist capabilities, Jonathan, can you spot the Windex bottle in this video? I've made it a little bit extra difficult to find, but it is there. Brian asks, what are your thoughts on how Canon has two separate mirrorless lines, the M and the RF, or to be more accurate, the EFM and the RF? Why can't Canon follow their EF, EFS line with an RF, RFS line, which could allow more interchangeability? Well, actually, I put out a video back in April that talked about a rumor, again by Canon Rumors, stating that we're going to be getting an APS-C sensor camera in the RF mount, and it won't have a different designation. It won't be in RFS, for example. Now, the reason why we do have two different mounts is the, 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 uh, the EFM mount came out first, and it was designed to be a mirrorless version of the, well, the APS-C line. Well, when Canon thought about coming out with a, a full frame, they went back to the drawing board, they looked at redesigning a mount, they looked at everything, and it, it, it's, it's a solid mount. The, the lenses out are really, really good, but you've got different tolerances, and it's actually physics that will actually prevent you from being able to um, take those that EF glass and be able to put it on an RF. Uh, so I think if I remember correctly, the, the RF mount is uh, between the sensor, the sensor mount point is 20 millimeters, whereas on EFM, it's 18 millimeters. You could physically do it, but it only gives you two millimeters to create the adapter. And while potentially possible, um, I can't imagine how they'd be able to create an adapter within two millimeters. And of course, going the other way around, you'd have to actually put the mount point with inside the body. So um, there, is, there is no way you're not going to be able at any point, there is no adapter that's going to come out that's going to allow you to take the EFM glass and put it on the RF mount. And uh, really, why would you? Because even if you were to take the EFS glass, which you can and put it on the R5, for example, you're going to carry over that crop. So you're not truly benefiting from it. Um, it, it just is what it is. Uh, if you buy into the EFM mount and you're someday thinking of going to full frame and you want to get into the RF mount, then buy EF glass and mount it onto the uh, EFM uh, body because you can do that. You can buy an adapter that allows you to do that. And then if you go ahead and migrate to an RF camera later on, you can bring that EF glass with you. So it's something to really think about. You also want to think about, well, what's the cost of buying all this Investing in the EFM, would it make more sense to go to the uh, an RF camera? Uh, something you really have to think about because for me, the idea of having glass that I can't migrate, um, that's a definite no-no. Um, that's the one thing that's kind of held me off on looking at the EFM uh, um, in any seriousness at all. That's why when the 90D came out versus the, the 6D Mark II, um, the 90D was far more appealing to me because I could use my existing glass and I could take that glass and move it to the RF. Whereas with the EFM, sure, I could adapt my current EF glass, but any new EFM glass I bought, well, would be, I couldn't migrate it. So I, hopefully I answered your question. I went a little bit off topic there, but um, yeah, thanks for your question. <laughs> Dan asks, do you know if the R6 overheats when using full HD 1080p? 4K footage has never interested me because of the file size, and most people are watching YouTube videos on their phones for now. Uh, no, I've never heard of anything. Uh, when Canon put out their uh, um, chart, it, had, it didn't cover 1080 at all. I do know that in the uh, R5, it doesn't overheat in 4K 30 and below, so that includes 1080. So I, I really doubt that it does overheat in um, on the R6 as well. There's been a ton of information coming out. If it overheated in 1080 on the R6, I'm pretty sure we would know about it by now, for sure. Um, 
the announcement for the R5 was what? I think it was just two weeks ago now, um, and people had the R6. I'd be pretty surprised if it overheated in 1080. Uh, that would just be a that would be a major major issue. And I and with this all, all this talk about overheating and firmware updates, I'm pretty sure that they're going to come out and address the uh, R6 because at 24.99, that's an awful lot of money to pay for a camera that can't even do 4K 30 without um, overheating. So I'd I'd tell you that's a bit of an issue. O asks. What would you like to have as your main camera, the A7 III or the R5? Well, I'm shooting the R5 now. This is my seven day do seventh day doing it, and I love it. I think it's working great. I'll know better in about a month because you, after a couple of days, a week, it's kind of like dating. The person might seem great, but it isn't until you get to know, know them a bit better whether you can tell if the person's right for you or not. It's the same with a camera. This camera's great after seven days. I'm loving it, but you know, come back to me in a month and ask me how well is it doing. Is it improving my workflow? Is it making my life better? Is it providing better results? And then I want to do the same with the A7S III. I want to get that in here and I want to have it for about a month. I want to test it out and do the exact same thing. And then at that point I can decide which camera is best for me. Now I am a little bit biased uh, because, well, for one simple reason, I'm shooting with the 51.2, that's the EF glass. And for $130, I was able to migrate this expensive lens over instead of having to pay another $2,300 for that lens. So that's a really big, huge thing for me. And now that I got the, e, the RF 24 to 105, that's my second piece of glass. Um, so that, that does play into it a little bit. It's not just whether, like, let's, let's say this right here and now. Let's assume that the A7S III is a way better camera for me and my, my capabilities. I have to look at the cost of migration too. I've got about three or four batteries as well, and they're not cheap either. They're about $100 a piece, Canadian. So I would have to come up with new batteries. There's $400 lost. And, you know, yes, I can sell my gear, but you never get the, the same amount of money back. So I do have to pay attention to that. But if I've got both cameras, then I can switch them out, try different ones. But I'm really curious to try the Sony indoors. Uh, and in the heat that I have right now, it's probably, yeah, 63 degrees. The, the A7S III would be a, a stellar camera for what I'm doing. Luke Williams asks, what are your thoughts on how far we are away from the A7 IV? That's a very timely question. I actually put out a video yesterday talking about this. Uh, now, it comes from Sony Rumors, and I don't know how credible their source is. Uh, the source said several things, and one, and among that, Sony's going to be releasing the A7 IV this fall, and I would expect it to be somewhere between mid to late September into October. And if they don't, somebody needs to go to Sony, Sony headquarters, and just sit down their top guy and have a big stern talking to them. Canon's having all this um, bad press about the overheating on the R5 and the R6, and what are otherwise very, very excellent cameras. So while all, all this is going on, Sony needs to get out there and say, hey, oh, by the way, here's our R, R4, R4. Here's our A7 IV, look at it. It doesn't overheat, it's a great photo camera, it does great video. Would you like to try it? Use that Sun Tzu kind of, you know, what's the best way to fight by not fighting at all? And, you know, Canon's a little bit down right now. There, there's rumors that we're not going to get any more cameras until about November, December. Yeah, December. I was watching Peter Greg live last night, and he says he has sources saying we may not hear something till December. So, uh, yeah, Sony's got an opportunity here. Um, they shouldn't wait five years for the A7 IV. Ah, five years. Can't believe. And one thing else they talked about in that video too is that Sony was actually ready and scheduled to announce the um, the A7S III in late 2018, but decided not to because, in their view, there just wasn't enough competition. So they wanted to uh, milk their current products as much as they could. Yeah. So good question. Pink Donkey asks, "Who do you think the R5 is designed for?" Well, I think first and foremost, the Canon sees the R5 as a five series camera, which is for people that value results, uh, photographers that want really, really good photos, that can get the shot, uh, that can perform very, very well, uh, that is reliable, durable, uh, but that also offers solid video capabilities. Um, and then you've got people like me that are hobbyists. I'm kind of a strange example here because if you completely get rid of the YouTube stuff. I'm just a hobbyist. I'm not the person that would normally buy this, but there's a huge group of us that love technology, that happen to love camera technology, and want the best that we can get that isn't 
silly, like getting a C300 and walking around town while I shoot my son is a little bit silly, but the R5, that's kind of the top end of what I would realistically be able to have as a travel camera to do everything else. And there is a huge section of people that do that. So uh, it works very well for YouTube. Uh, for 4K30, it does a really good job. For 1080p, it does a good job. Uh, for photos, it does a very, very good job. Um, I'm, I'm really, really impressed with the autofocus. I took it out yesterday morning, about the same time as today, around 8 o'clock, and I shot my son. He was on the swing. Now, I'm a terrible photographer. I haven't really shot in years. But I was impressed looking at the LCD and the viewfinder, how the autofocus just locked on the entire time and followed him. It was fast. There was no lag. Um, but I needed to adjust some of my other settings because there was a little bit of a blur. And the reason for the blur was is he's moving and I didn't have my settings set up properly. But it never missed the focus. It was just unbelievable. Uh, plus, you, then you add in the IBIS for that stabilization. So if low light isn't the greatest, you've got that as well the faster processor. Um, it's, it's one of those cameras where if you've got a shoot to do and you need a camera that's reliable, this is the type of camera that it's made for. Uh, I, I'd say it's much more balanced now uh, than its predecessor, the 5D Mark IV, towards video. Uh, we've got 10-bit, which is what I'm shooting on now. We've got 8-bit. We've got H.265, H.264. We've got 1080 all the way up to 8K. And yes, the 8K and the 4K60 and the 4K HQ do have some overheating limits, but the rest of the resolutions are just stellar. Like you can keep recording. I've recorded for about 30 minutes now. Uh, I did stop at once at 21 minutes. I thought it'd be a good break to go up and reset it because I hate it when the camera stops recording um, and I don't know. And I've taken some precautions. I don't have the flip screen turned around because I'll keep looking at it instead of you. It's that shiny object, right? Which is a shiny object. That's what we look at. Immediately blow the camera where you can't see. I have my computer with all the questions and I use this mouse to advance the frame. And immediately below that, I have an iPad that's connected directly to the camera. So I can see if it's filming, I can see my lighting and all that, which is very, very helpful. It's using Bluetooth, so that's gonna wear down the battery a bit more, but that's something else I'm also measuring in this video to see how much battery I can get out of one of these brand new Canon batteries. I've already recharged it once, so um, I would like to generally record these things about, or sorry, discharge them about two or three times before I do a battery test, but this will give you a rough idea. So really good question, Pink Donkey. How do you think about buying the right Sony lens for the long term? You gotta be reflective. You've gotta think of what you're trying to accomplish. What are the capabilities? What results do you wanna do? What kind of stuff do you shoot? Now me, I'm a bit of a hobbyist. I do a lot of run and gun stuff. It's a lot of family stuff that I, I tend to shoot. So I need something that's gonna work with me without me having to have a bag of lenses and keep flipping them out and changing the lenses. And I find that the 24 to 105 is my best general purpose lens for that kind of stuff. So if I'm going out with my son or anybody else, this is the lens that's gonna go on there and it's gonna work in most situations. It uh, has a constant F4. Uh, I wish it was a little wider, that I can do F2 or something, but that's, you know, there's always gonna be a compromise, but that's my travel lens. For my YouTube stuff, um, I, I always go to the 51.2. I, I really do like that lens. I've fallen in love with it. Sure, I could probably have fun with a 20 millimeter, but I don't do vlogging. And having had surgery, I can't do that. I just can't lift it and hold it like that. But if you're into portrait photography, the 50 again would be a great lens. But what about an 85 millimeter? Or what about a 100 millimeter? Um, or uh, if, you, if you like zooms, then what about something uh, on the Canon side? You got the 28 to 70 or on Sony and others, you have 24 to 70. There's so many different focal lengths. Uh, what about a 135 millimeter? Um, you haven't given me enough where I can say, take a look at these different lenses. The best thing to do is to sit down and think about what you shoot most of the time and then take a look at lenses that will give you the results that you're looking for. Clive asks, is Nikon Z5 a good camera? Yeah, it's a, it's a great camera. Um, it does have some minor issues. Um, it's got a 1.7 times crop. And I've, I've looked at the Nikon Z5 and kind of lined it up with the EOS R. And I'd say they're very, very similar cameras. Yes, the Z5 is newer. Yes, it beats it in some areas. But in other areas, the EOS R beats it. Or, and I'd say in most areas, they're very, very comparable cameras. And wouldn't you know it, they're priced right about the same. The problem I have with the EOS R is that when it came out in 2018, it was, well, it was behind the times. It wasn't, didn't have all the features. And here we have the Z5s coming out in 2020, very similar to the 
EOS R and same thing. It is it's not what I would call bleeding edge in terms of capabilities. There's some features that are missing. And at the price point, I'd say it's a little pricey. I'd wait for it to go on sale. Like this camera right around a thousand dollars, I think it'd be a terrific camera. Don't get completely turned off by that crop in 4K. Uh, for a lot of people, it's not gonna be a big issue. I think it's a good solid camera. But the pricing is where I have the issue because I look at other cameras that can be had for less like the 90D, uh, the TAI, um, and I think they offer much better value. Yes, they're not full frame, but I, I think they offer far more value. So great question, thank you. Threndu asks, for studio setup, YouTube videos only, what's the best full frame mirrorless camera? EOS R, RP, A7 III, or A7S III? Uh, first of all, all three of them would do really well. I'd probably ignore the RP. I think that the EOS R offers far better value for the extra cost. And the A7S III is 3500 dollars It's the newest one, it's the most capable, but you're not going to need most of those features for a YouTube channel. I'll be honest with you, 1080, sharp 1080 is more than sufficient for YouTube. And 4K30 is nice to have as well. I'd be looking at the EOS R or the A7 III. I think both of those two cameras are going to give you a much better price. The EOS R is going to probably drop in price very soon with the R6 and the R5 out there. And I think that's going to be a really, really good value. So I'd be looking at either of those two cameras. So the next question to then ask is, do you have any lenses? If you do, and you have Sony glass, well then go with the a7 III. If you have Canon glass, then go with the EOS R. And they're going to do very well. Yes, they're not sexy. Yes, they're not going to get you more views by saying, I shot this in the R5. But the R5 and the a7S III, they're expensive. $3,500 for the a7S III and $38.99 for the R5, and that's just for the body alone, let alone lenses. So if you're looking at getting started out, the a7 III and the, um, the EOS R are a great way to get started. I'm going to give you what you need. And the EOS R also has C-Log too, which is great. Don't know if the a7 III has C-Log, but you guys can correct me in the comment section down below. Andrew says, 4K30 non-HQ, 4K30 crop, and 1080 are the three video modes that don't overheat. Can you compare the quality and low light performances of these models to each other and the 8K 4K HQ to gain an understanding of which unrestricted video modes is best and how much worse it is than the 4K HQ mode? Yeah, I'm definitely going to do that, Andrew. Now, all the videos I've put out so far, I always state the frame rates and how I'm shooting them to give you an idea. Uh, this is YouTube. Um, I'll be honest with you, 4K 30 is going to be more than sufficient most of the time. 4K 38 bit is going to be more than sufficient. I'm doing 4K 30 10-bit today, but all my videos, this is how I shoot them. I shoot 1080p if it's news and rumors and I have to get it out quickly because I do not have time to wait for them to finish editing. I, it, it just takes an awful lot of time once you jump up to 4K. For videos like this one, I shoot it in the morning. I'm done by usually about 9 o'clock. I take it into the computer, make sure everything looks good. I might do my color grading and balancing then, and then I'll go on with my day, and then I'll come back and I'll do some more editing later. I'm not in a rush. It can take an hour to export. It doesn't matter. But those other modes really do matter. Now, 4K HQ, what I can tell you is the detail is stunning. For the first time yesterday, I actually took my R5 out, shot my son. He was playing in the backyard just over there, and he was playing with some cars and trucks. And through the view screen, I could see, wow, the detail is really good there. And I was impressed with how the autofocus, he's moving these with his hands. And I tapped on his hand and the R5 said, okay, yeah, his hand. Yeah, I'll follow that. Or yeah, I'll follow the motorcycle. And it followed it. I couldn't believe how well it followed it. But when I took it into post and I compared it to my 70D, yes, it's a seven-year-old camera, but the difference was night and day. You're getting 8K oversampled video and I'm downsampling it to 4K. And because the video I started uh, in November, I do these one-year montages where each month I'll have like, oh, July, and then we'll see what he did in July. And you can watch him grow, out, grow up throughout the year. They're generally 90-minute videos. So unfortunately, it's 1080p. But when I start the new one in November, it's going to be 4K. But watching it on my TV, my 4K LG TV, uh, the detail was stunning. It, it's almost as though... Well, I wear glasses, and if you wear glasses, and you, it's kind of like the difference between wearing glasses and not wearing glasses, how sharp it is. So my recommendation would be to shoot in 4K 30, uh, downsample it to 1080, or 
if you're doing run and gun stuff where you're just shooting clips because I've never had it overheat at all. I'll shoot him, you know, maybe 30 seconds from this angle. I'll move around and shoot him for another 30 seconds from this angle. I might shoot him for a minute from this angle. Then he'll do something else and you'd be surprised. You can waste a half an hour and maybe not get more than about five or 10 minutes of video and not overheating. And that 4K HQ is just stunning. Uh, the detail is there. Uh, but for YouTube, for YouTube, I really didn't notice much of a difference being between 4K HQ and regular 4K 30 after you take into account the YouTube compression. But if you're not doing YouTube compression, that's where you'll notice a difference. So give me a few more weeks as I do more videos and I get more experience and get to see the detail, then I'll be able to do a full review and say, this is the results. These are the frame rates. These are the resol resolutions. And this is where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. But um, it's, it's, this camera really has stunned me. And I, I, I will admit, uh, one of the reasons why I'm so impressed is because I've been with the 70D for so long. Um, if I was shooting with the EOS R and I went to the R5, I probably wouldn't be nearly as impressed. And that's just the pure honesty of it. Um, I, I want to admit something to you guys. I am, I've been accused of being a Canon fanboy, and I'll admit it, I am a Canon fanboy. I'm a Sony fanboy. I'm a Nikon fanboy. I'm basically a bit of a camera geek. I love gear. I love tech. I love hearing how things improve. I love watching all sorts of videos on other cameras too. And when they do virtual announcements, I'm there because I really want to see Nikon when they announce their Z8. I want it to be the best camera that it can be. I want it to be better than the R5. I want it to be better than the A7S III. I want it to be different, to have its own niche. Because the more entrants we have in the market, the better the competition and the more choices that we have. Dogka asks, I know IBIS can be turned off completely from the lens, but what about if you have third-party lenses such as the Sigma? Can IBIS be shut off completely through the menu system also? That's a good question. I haven't been able to find any settings. I've looked several times through the menu system. Uh, I have been preoccupied with other videos, but I, I haven't been able to find the setting where you can turn it off. I'm I'm assuming it can be turned off, but I honestly can't find out where that is. And it's got me a little puzzled. So if you guys have found out where you can turn it off, let me know. Um, but it's kind of like four wheel drive in cars. I've had cars where four wheel drive is there and you have absolutely no control over it. The car will tell you or will give you four wheel drive when it's needed. In other cars, you have so much control over it where you can pretty well destroy the thing. So I'm, I'm sorry I don't have the answer to it, um, but I will find out more and get back to you on this one. David says, I'm now considering the R6 with a 3.7 megapixel viewfinder. I've never used an EVF, always an optical viewfinder. Will I be negatively aware it's not optical? The R5 is 5.7 megapixels and the Sony is almost 10 megapixels. I'm worried this will be an issue for me. Well, I've only been shooting photography for a few hours, yes, well, for about an hour yesterday. And what I noticed is, yeah, you can definitely tell the difference. Now, if you're shooting subjects that aren't moving, you'll get used to it. It's not a big issue at all. I found it to be quite simple to use. But if you're moving the camera, I find that there's enough of a lag that it's really, really annoying. Uh, I'm going to spend a bit more time today looking in the settings to see if there's something I can do to offset that. But as it stands right now, if you're just shooting... Um, subjects that aren't moving not a problem uh, you do get used to it but if like i said there is a bit of a lag with the default settings the mcronical asks if you're buying the canon r6 what would be the best lens lineup to start off with if you don't have any glass well it really depends on whether you're doing photo or video work um, if you're just if you're the, an ordinary filmmaker or photographer um, you know you can't it can't hurt to start with a general purpose lens like the 24 to 105 f4 uh, it's a great travel lens, it'll go with you anywhere, run and gun, that kind of stuff, and it does photo and video quite well. However, if you are going to getting, be getting more into uh, filming, then I would seriously consider getting the, uh, the 15 to 35. Uh, I think that would be a really, really good lens as well. Um, if you're getting into photography, um, I really like the 28 to 70. It's a really, really good lens, but as far as the macro goes, the 51.2, and I'm shooting on a 51.2 EF now. Uh, also the uh, 85 millimeter, 100 millimeter, and 135 millimeter. And rumored lenses that I'd keep an eye open for would be the um, 14 to 28 and the 70 to 135. So those are lenses I would consider. Again, it depends on your budget and what you're shooting. Um, give me a bit more information, I can give you a better answer. 
Indy asks, what innovations could smartphone companies come up with for ordinary filmmakers and photographers? Will they want to? Have they given all they can? No, they definitely haven't given all they can. And the one thing I'd like to say right off the bat with these smartphones is um, quite often the cameras inside them aren't that great. You have a high F value. Uh, you're usually sh uh, shooting with, due to the crop factor, a minimum of the equivalent of an F8 or F11. But where these cameras really, really shine is the ease of use. It's so easy to take photos. It's so easy to take videos. It's so very easy to edit them. And the cameras quite often take all the complexity out of enhancing the photo and the video to the point where you really don't have to do much. And there's an awful lot of computational power behind that, checking the dynamic range, checking the ISO, checking low light, checking color, checking balance, all these things for a single photo, it might do 12 different bits of processing on the image to produce a pretty good result. So ease of use, I'd say, is the single biggest um, win that these cameras get. And one of the reasons they're so easy to use too is uh, the whole app ecosystem. So you can easily take a photo and video and then you can very quickly edit it or the camera can edit it for you automatically or the phone can edit it for you automatically. And then you have the ability to publish it, transmit it, do anything you want with it, all seamlessly, all very easy. So ease of use is very good. The app ecosystem, the convergence of all the different technologies and a single platform that is portable and lightweight, that is huge. And then what they're starting to do is they started to say, hey, let's see if we can't simulate bokeh. Uh, Apple, I think, first started doing it. And by and large, it works pretty good. Now, if you pixel peep, then yes, you can definitely tell the difference. But for a lot of people, for putting it up on social media, Instagram and whatnot, they're pretty happy with these results and it's going to get better. They're going to fine tune uh, these effects. Uh, and the, I'd say those are some of the biggest strengths of the, the smartphone is not the quality of the hardware that makes up the phone, the lens and all that sort of stuff. It's the computational power around it, the app ecosystem, and the fact that it offers what I consider to be a superior customer experience. It's just truly remarkable, but it doesn't replace the optics of a camera. And that's the one thing they're trying to simulate that. And until they get there, um, you're, you're, the, 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 the DSLR mirrorless camera is still got a place to be. Robert asks, my question is, if you can possibly read this many questions, Another question is, is if you thought that there would be as many questions when you started. No, I had no idea. I was almost like I was begging for questions when I started. I had about maybe eight and the videos didn't last as long. Now um, I pretty well cap out at around 22 questions and let the videos go as long as they go based on those questions. Uh, quite often I have over 60 and it's a really, really tough thing. What I try to do throughout the week is if I'm asked really good questions, I will actually go ahead and grab those, put them into the PowerPoint and get them ready. And then on Wednesday night or Thursday, I go ahead and do a call out for questions. And what I look for is I look for a variety of questions. Uh, if you're the first to post a question, most likely your question is going to be surfaced. But I'm, I am looking for variety. I don't want everything. So for example, this week we had a lot of talk about the R5 overheating. So I only want maybe a few questions of that. I want to have a really large variety of questions from multiple cameras, multiple platforms to make it more interesting. Um, now, sometimes I'll see there's a trend. Um, on July the 12th, there was a lot of questions about IPB and all I. So I took three of them. Uh, they were similar but different, and I put them into that video. So there was a segment on all I and IPB. Part of it getting into the actual physicalities of what it means and how you produce it, and then the actual results. And it's the same with this video here. I'm doing the same thing, um, grouping different questions together, and usually by I would say Thursday night, I've already got maybe 80% of the questions and then I fine tune it Friday evening and uh, sort of put answers or things that I want to talk to on a, a given question. Because sometimes I'll have an idea, oh yeah, I want to say this and I'm filming and I completely forget of what it is I want to say. Now I've already shot this video, I've taken it into the computer and I started to do some color balancing and all that and what I noticed, one terrible, terrible thing is in the last four questions, autofocus started going nuts. Now keep in mind, this is an EF lens that has been adapted to the camera. Uh, I don't know if it's a problem with the lens. I don't know if it was a problem with the adapter or anything like that. I have had some issues with this lens in the past where it would just stop autofocusing on my 70D. So I'm more willing to believe that it is the EF 50 millimeter maybe starting to show its age. 
sadly. Um, lighting did change a little bit, so I shifted. I've got a different view here, and hopefully this will work out nicely. But I want to give you a bit of a feedback on terms of battery life. Now, before I started shooting this piece here, I had shot an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, that's what I brought into the computer, and I think I shot another 10 minutes. So I got an hour and a half of video on the battery, and the battery or the camera was showing that the battery was half discharged. Now, that's actually a little bit misleading. When you get down to, I think, um, two bars left, you're actually less than 50%. So it can be down to as low as, I think, 25 or 30%. But as far as a single battery, yeah, continuous recording, 4K 30. I got as much as an hour and 30 minutes, and I'm still recording on that battery right now. So you can add at least another 10 minutes to that. So an hour and 40 minutes. So that's pretty good. I also want to give you a bit of a feedback on the CF Express card. When I took it out of the camera, it wasn't hot at all. It was, you know, warm, like room temperature kind of warm. It wasn't any, it was warm enough that I, it felt a little bit, um, you know, you could tell there's a little bit of heat there, but nothing significant. And that was after, like I said, recording for about an hour and 20 minutes. So that's pretty good. And I also have some stats for you um, on the um, transfer rate. It actually took me less time to transfer an hour and 20 minutes of 4K 30 footage off of the camera than it took to cop copy the, the video or the audio off the Tascam. Uh, it's, I hooked directly into the Tascam. It would be quicker if I took the card out of the Tascam, put it into an SD card, put it in the computer, but I don't do that because I don't want to keep, it's one of those really, really tiny uh, ports and I don't want to risk damaging it. So I hook it in and it took probably about 30 to 40 percent more time to offload the audio which was only 650 megabytes as opposed to the um the video file so it gives you an idea of how fast that cf express is but yeah i'm, I'm surprised i thought the card would have been hotter i guess it's in some of those other modes the hq modes the 8k modes where it generates more heat out of the cf express card so i was very pleasantly surprised but a big thank you to you guys i really do appreciate you guys um, submitting questions, supporting my channel, um, just watching my videos, commenting, engaging is what is making this channel as, as, accessible, uh, as successful as it is today. Here I am on 11,000 subscribers. I was just 10,000 um, not too long ago. Um, I, I'm pretty impressed and I do have a lot to learn. I want to improve on my studio to make it look better. I want to improve upon my color grading. I'm experimenting with 10-bit right now and 10-bit I got to admit is a little bit difficult you'll see some videos where they'll say oh we can help you color grade in 30 seconds sure it's a lot more complex than that you got to balance it first and then something doesn't quite go right now you have to fiddle around with the color board the color levels and it can take 10-15 minutes to really fiddle with it when things don't go right so 10-bit's great but for the ordinary average filmmaker, I'd, honestly, I'd stick with 8-bit. I think 8-bit is fine. And uh, next week, I'm going to go back to 8-bit just because of the amount of time it takes to process this. And if I get something wrong, it's an awful lot to reshoot over again, whereas 8-bit is pretty, pretty easy to deal with and pretty simple. But again, guys, thank you so much for supporting the channel. Uh, big shout out. I don't know who did it. Somebody bought an R5, um, I think, two days ago at B&H, and I do appreciate that. Uh, that translates to, to about $77 US, which goes back into getting gear, because I'm trying to save up for that Sony a7S III. Uh, it's not gonna be cheap. I just spent all my money on the R5, so that's my next plan. But I do appreciate all the support you guys give me from just engaging, from feedback, from advice. Um, it's very much appreciated. So thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon.